Bren Moen? Here. Sorry. Jalali? Here. Naker? Here. Prince? Here. Tolbert? Here. Yang? Here. Seven present, zero absent. Item number one, resolution 23-956. Authorization to de designate Face-to-Face -face Health and Counseling Service, Inc., a Minnesota nonprofit corporation as tentative developer of 1170 Arcade Street, District 5, Ward 6. Dr. Goodman. Thank you, Chair Tolbert. Commissioners, this item will approve the designation of Face-to-Face -face Health and Counseling Service as tentative developer of the HRA-owned property at 1170 Arcade Street for a period of 24 months, ending in June of 2025, to allow time for, to finalize financing, construction costs, and approvals needed to redevelop the property. This property is approximately a quarter of an acre. It was acquired um, by the HRA in 2008, has been vacant since then, and was previously the site of a gas station, though the tanks have since been removed. This past November, the HRA released an RFP for the property, and two proposals were received. In February, HRA staff and staff members from the Ward 6 office and the Mayor's office reviewed both proposals and interviewed both proposers. The proposals were evaluated with consideration of neighborhood redevelopment vision and uh, review criteria outlined in the RFP. The neighborhood vision for the property was for a mix of uses, including destination commercial, office, light, and, uh, light industrial, and multifamily housing, favoring high-quality building designs and sites that provide aesthetically pleasing public spaces and contribute to a sense of safety. The review committee has recommended that face-to-face's proposal was best aligned with the review criteria and redevelopment vision of the HRA. In that, the proposal provides the largest number and greatest variety of housing types, including efficiency, one-bedroom and two-bedroom units, all at deeply affordable rates. The proposed mix of uses is compatible with the site and the neighborhood and includes offices on the ground floor and jobs created through expanded services to the community. The proposal was well, well prepared and easy to understand in terms of project goals, timeline, financial feasibility, and design. Face-to-Face -face assembled an experienced development team of architects, contractors, and consultants and declared an intent to explore a partnership with another more experienced nonprofit housing developer um, if necessary. Face-to-Face -face has been operating across the street from this property for many years and is well-rooted in the community. They propose to redevelop the property with a four-story mixed-use building, including 20 housing units, five efficiencies, nine one-bedrooms, and six two-bedroom units on floors two through four, and 6,000 square feet of nonprofit office space on the ground floor. The office level would have several individual offices, meeting rooms, a lounge, waiting room, restrooms, focus rooms, and a bike storage room. Projected rents and income restrictions for the housing unit are proposed to be at 30% at at of area median income. Um, so future possible actions will include of, uh, an approval of the development agreement, which may include uh, public financing and holding a public hearing for the sale of the property. Because the sources and uses have not yet been finalized, compliance requirements cannot be determined, but a compliance letter outlining the specific compliance requirements that will apply to the project will be required before seeking approval of a development agreement. Project manager Jonathan Reister is here today, as well as several, several members of the development team, if you have any specific questions, and staff recommends approval of the item. Any questions or comments? Um, Commissioner Yang. Thank you. Um, well, Chair Tolbert, I'm, if it's all right with you, I wanted to invite folks from face to face to come and introduce themselves. I'm so glad that you all were able to join us in person. And um, also, I wanted to share that I had a phenomenal time touring their, um, their site right on Arcade Street. And I think there's just so many phenomenal services that you all provide in your facility. I would love for council members to hear all about it, too, and learn a bit more about the folks in the community who you do serve on a daily basis and why the, the project here, especially in building affordable housing, uh, why it's important to you. If you come. Yeah. <laughs> Stand right in between the two. In between. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. My name is Hannah Gitacho Cruiser, the executive director at Face to Face. Really, really excited that we are here today. We have been in the community for about 50 years, over 50 years, providing services in the medical clinic, mental health, and the state of Minnesota and the county um, asked us to develop um, housing opportunities or for homeless youth in 1994. So we've been operating a day shelter and really have seen the need to expand um, housing for our young people and, and their families. So we're, we're, we're looking to um, 
eliminate some barriers that our young people have in their families so we to, by providing the affordable housing so that's that's a piece that we're really excited about we also work with Ramsey County Attorney's Office in partnership around youth youth justice and we were just recently developed a, a workforce development uh, program for our young people because as you all know uh, housing by itself does not um, work you have to have all the the right things in place including income so really excited to to be a resource uh, for a lot of young people uh, um, experiencing homelessness or, or or other forms of instability we serve close to 3,000 young people each year and in all of the different programs that we have and this 20 unit uh, would really offer the opportunity to, to work on stability for a lot of uh, families. And so we're, we're really excited. And then having the support in the building as well as across the street, that's also what's fascinating for us. So thank you. And we have a board member here quickly who wants to say something. Our board chair. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Kotke. I live at uh, 570 on Otis Avenue in Denoyer Park uh, in St. Paul. And over a period of 40 years, I, I've seen patients with heart disease at the University of Minnesota Mayo Clinic and uh, Regents Hospital. My day job now is medical director for well-being at Health Partners. Uh, my focus is on community programs that improve the health and well-being of all members of the uh, community. <clears throat> I chair the board of face to face, and I would bet that at least one of you are thinking, "Well, what's this old white guy cardiologist uh, doing advocating for um, uh, youth of color in St. Paul?" Well, I do this because it's clear to me that a supportive environment at a critical point in a young person's life changes that life for good, for forever. That's important. It's also clear clear to me that young folks with a vision of a positive future are less likely to steal cars, fire guns at people, and do those kind of things. Stable, supportive housing is one of those sources of help. This is not unlike the dorms we send our kids to when we send them off to college. That's simply supportive housing. I'm a member of the Community Preventive Task, uh, Services Task Force, a panel of public health and prevention experts appointed by the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I mention this because the task force has reported that the benefits of permanent supportive housing outweigh the cost by a factor of 1.8 to 1. So you're making a very good investment. I'm here to thank you simply for allowing face-to-face -to, -face to submit a proposal for a building at 1170 Arcade. And as mentioned, our, we've assembled an outstanding team that is experienced, and uh, we believe that you're going to be very excited and uh, pleased with the product. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Commissioner Yang? Thank you. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to um, comment that I am so grateful to the team at Face to Face for really the, the unique vision you bring, and also it's so mission-driven in serving our folks of color and young people who are experiencing homelessness. And so, um, you know, it, it really, I, I feel like, you know, just really set you apart from all the all the different, I, I would say, like development that I've seen uh, in my ward overall. And so I want to say thank you for your work. And also I just want to say thanks to the staff in PED too. I just feel like we've been able to check off so many wonderful projects in Ward 6 from the Hafner site to this RFP process for 1170 Arcade Street. And I know we've got a lot of work at the Heights too, but there's major progress happening. And so I'm really grateful to all of you for being able to make it happen and pulling in folks from uh, my office. Thanks, Jayla, for being on the RFP. P, uh, committee for this too. So I'm excited to support this. Great. Yeah. Take that as a motion. Commissioner Prince. Yeah, and, and um, Commissioner Yang has said all the important stuff. I just want to also thank um, this council or this board of commissioners. About four years ago in May, um, we as the city council hosted a listening session from members of the community and organizations that work in the area of youth homelessness. And we discovered on that day just how seriously this problem was 
um, growing. And then we went through COVID. Um, a result of that listening session was the formation of the United for Action to End Youth and Family Homelessness group that included families that were homeless as well as notably today, Face to Face, who has been such an active contributing member of all of these efforts. So I, I just want to um, extend my gratitude and congratulations to Face to Face on making this happen. This is just the kind of project that we foresaw when we held that listening session. And, and we are definitely moving in the right direction. So thanks to everyone and to PED as well. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Yang. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Congratulations. Chair Tolbert, I'd also just like to recognize Jonathan Reister for his managing of this, of this uh, project. This is one that we've been hoping to get done for quite a while, and he did a really beautiful job of managing the process. So thank you. Seven in favor, none opposed. The resolution is adopted. Item number two, resolution 23-958. Approving modifications to the 20, 2002 home loan to St. Paul Family Project Limited Partnership, owner of Jackson, Jackson Street Village Project, located at 1497 Jackson, Jackson Street, District 6, Ward 5. Director Goodman. Thank you, Chair Tolbert. Commissioners, the Jackson Street Village Townhome Project, again, is located at 1497 Jackson Street, was developed in 2002 by the St. Paul Family Project Limited Partnership. R.S. Eden is a managing general partner. The project has 25 deeply affordable rental townhomes that serve families, 16 of them set aside for households, meeting the HUD definition of chronically homeless. Due to the age of the project, substantial rehabilitation is now required. RS Eden anticipates requesting rehabilitation funding this summer from Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and possibly 9% tax credits from St. Paul to finance the cost of the needed rehabilitation. To enhance the competitiveness of its application to MHFA for new financing, RS Eden is requesting that the St. Paul HRA approve modifications, following modifications to the HRA's 2002 home loan, uh, which was made to the borrower. All of these proposed modifications are contingent upon the borrower closing on that MHFA rehab financing. Those proposed modifications include extending the maturity date of the existing loan by up to 30 years from the anticipated closing, loan closing, MHFA loan closing, so that the new maturity date could be coterminous with the maturity date of the anticipated MHFA rehab financing, reducing the interest rate from 2% to 0%, effective on the closing date. All interest accrued under the 2002 home loan would be due at the new maturity date. If the MHFA requires it in connection with its new financing, we would agree to subordinate the 2002 mortgage to the new MHFA lien. The St. Paul loan, um, HRA loan, loan for this project has a principal balance of $387,500 and current accrued interest of $161,879. Principal Project Manager Marie Franchette and representatives from the development team are here if you have any questions, and staff recommends approval of the item. Any questions or comments? All right, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Brenmon. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Seven in favor, none opposed. The resolution is adopted. Item number three, resolution 23-962, authorizing and recommending approval of financing of a $550,000 home loan, authorizing and recommending approval of financing of a $1,950,000 ARPA loan, and execution of the loan agreements for the Treehouse Senior Housing Project, District 15, Ward 3. Director Goodman. Thank you, Chair Tolbert, Commissioners. This item will approve, again, a $550,000 home loan and a $1,950,000 American Rescue Plan Act loan, ARPA loan, to the Treehouse Senior Housing Project. In January of 2022, the HRA Board approved the reservation of 9% low-income housing tax credits from the City of St. Paul to the Treehouse Senior Housing Project, which consists of 36 units of affordable rental supportive housing for seniors age 55 and older. This parcel is just north and adjacent to 2319 West 7th Street, which is the location of an existing nursing care facility called the Highland Chateau in Highland Park. This project um, includes new construction. It's a five-story building with tuck-under parking and, again, 36 housing units. 27 of those will be affordable at 30% of AMI or less, and the remaining nine units will be affordable at 50% of AMI or less. Seven units will be set aside for high-priority homeless. These units will also benefit from housing supports, from a housing support subsidy from Ramsey County, 
and Catholic Charities will be the primary service provider. This project was selected through a formal solicitation review process for, the, uh, for PED's ARPA funds for the 30% AMI. Um, the, 19, the ARPA loan will have a 0% interest rate uh, with deferred payments for, for 50 years and will be in first position. Uh, same with the, the $550,000 home loan, but second position and $865,000 ARPA loan. Same except in third position as far as collateral. Uh, the District Council has submitted a letter of support for the Treehouse Project, and the project will be subject to vendor outreach, affirmative action, Davis-Bacon, Section 3, Project Labor Agreement, the two-bid policy, and the St. Paul Sustainable Development Ordinance. Principal Project Manager Diane Norquist is here, as well as Dan Walsh from Trellis. If you have any questions, and staff recommends approval of the item. Great. Thank you. Can you remind me how many years uh, this will be uh, obligated to be affordable housing? how long the affordability is. Let me see if I know that. I may have to defer to the project manager. <clears throat> Who's making her way up? Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, Diane Norquist, project manager with PED. Um, Chair Tolbert, your question was the affordability period. Correct. This one will be affordable for 50 years. 50? Great. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I will uh, take a motion to approve from Commissioner Jalali. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Seven in favor, none opposed. The resolution is adopted. And uh, we have a request to suspend the rules. A motion from uh, Commissioner Ballinger to suspend the rules. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Um, oppose. The rules are suspended. Please read the resolution. Resolution 23-959, recommending approval of a $65,000 CBG loan to Life Juices LLC or a related entity for acquisition, rehabilitation, and code compliance project at 450 Lexington Parkway North, District 8, Ward 1. Director Goodman, and could you start with the necessity to suspend the rules of the timing? Certainly, Chair Tolbert. We, we, we thought we were going to have everything in time for the agenda, then we didn't, and then we did. And so um, we are, honestly, I'm not positive what the, the timing is. If it may be related to other sources of funding that we're trying to meet deadlines for. There are several sources of funding for this project, so we were trying, and somebody else may know the answer to this question. Um, but I know we have a deadline that we're we, trying to meet. Could we have an answer? Because I do think it's important. If we're going to suspend rules, we don't, we do it for okay, timing exactly. purposes only, Let at me, least in my um, opinion. Project manager Rachel Weicker is here, and she may be able to tell us the specifics. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Rachel Weicker, project manager with PED. And yes, I do apologize for the confusion around this. So uh, as this is CDBG, we needed to get a historic review completed before we could submit the, is the environmental review. So we know that the uh, SHPO office had been delayed for several several weeks, um, but it took a couple calls to get that review completed on time um, or ahead of their schedule. And so what we were trying to do to make it to this date is that he is also going to NDC for funding approval on this date, and the contingency date, contingency date to close on the property is July 12th. So we were trying to make everything on to his schedule and the other financing schedule to make sure that the property could still close on time. Okay, and so hearing this at the next HRA meeting would would not allow that to happen? It would have been exactly hearing the exact date that funding was approved on the date that the seller would need to know that the funding was approved. So because we were going on a very, very tight timeline there, we wanted to relieve some of the pressure on the business owner. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Stafford. Okay. Go ahead. Um, this item will approve a $65,000 CDBG loan to Life Juices LLC for a project to acquire and rehabilitate a vacant building for a new juice and smoothie bar. Um, alternatively, in the event that the borrower is unable to uh, obtain a federally issued UEI number necessary to borrow CDBG funds, the HRA will be approving the loan to the borrower from the Business Assistance Fund um, with, this, with the same terms. Life Juices LLC is a company dedicated to bringing accessible nutrition to underserved communities where healthy offerings are lacking. The owner, Kali Terry, uses fruits and veggies as a tool for health, wealth, and social change. Life Juices offers cold-pressed juices, smoothies, and acai bowls, all made with organic produce sourced from local farms and food producers in Minnesota. The business is planning to expand from its current food truck and commissary kitchen service to a brick-and-mortar retail location 
near the uh, Green Line Lexington light rail stop. This project centers around the acquisition of the building at 450 Lexington Parkway North, which is under a purchase agreement. The building has been vacant and on the market since 2021. These loan funds will be used to acquire and rehabilitate the space, including making necessary updates to the plumbing, electrical, and HVAC systems, adding fire safety features, and improving accessibility per DSI's code compliance inspection. CDBG was identified as the most suitable source for this project. Um, HUD requires that recipients of CDBG meet one of three national objectives. In this case, the objective being met is the area-wide benefit, meaning the service the business provides will be available to all the residents in a particular area where at least 51% of the residents are low to mo low and moderate income. Owner equity is structured to cover 10% of the total project costs with the CDBG loan of 65,000 covering 75% of the total project costs. Again, other sources include funding from NDC and LISC. Um, again, project manager Rachel Wecker is here and developer Kali Terry are, is here as well if you have questions. Um, Kali is a emerging developer who be, we've been working with for a couple of years on a few different projects. So I'm really excited to see this move forward. And staff recommend approval of the item. Great. Any comments or questions? Approval? Yeah, I, I'd like to say that, um, that I think this business will add um, uh, a healthy alternative to what is being sold in some of the other businesses around. And to see the people that are putting this together will be a vision, uh, a possibility for the young people in our neighborhood. So I'm supporting them. Great. We have a motion to approve from Commissioner Ballinger. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion, the motion passes. Seven in favor, none opposed. The resolution is adopted. Item number four, SR 23-126, tax increment financing, TIF update. Great. Thank Director Goodman or Jenny yep, Wolf? Yep, Chair yeah. Tolbert, HRA Debt Manager Jenny Wolf is here with a brief update on our tax increment financing. Good afternoon. Welcome, Ms. Wolf. Chair Tolbert and Commissioners. I do have a PowerPoint here. Um, it does go through in the beginning with some basic slides about tax increment that I was not really gonna cover too much. Um, so I'm just gonna fly through those and kind of um, get right to the, the request um, of the board uh, to talk about our TIP districts that are expiring and how much we are capturing of the city's tax base. So just real quickly, tax increment is a um, tool that's uh, financing tool that's authorized under state law. So it is available to any city and uh, redevelopment authority within the state. Um, it captures the difference in the value of the current site and then the future development value. And it, the property owners in the TIF district continue to pay their taxes just like any other property in the city. Um, the geography of the TIF district, um, you have to have a project area and that project area can be larger, slightly larger than the TIF district if that's desired and that's where you can expend tax increments with limitations. How is the TIF district established? The first step is to notify the county commissioner for the area and then the school district and the county are to receive a copy of the draft TIF plan. The city council has to hold a public hearing and then the HRA board um, also approves the TIF district. So there's two bodies that will approve it at the city level. Um, what is in a TIF plan? So the TIF plan does need to identify the properties um, that will be contributing the tax increments. It'll identify the project area. It'll have a budget that shows what categories of funding are allowed and the maximum that can be spent, which includes the total tax increments to be collected from that TIF district. And then it also will talk about pooling limitations um, as required under statute. Um, our TIF review process, so PED does receive all applications for tax increment, and we review those to make sure that the um, requirements of our policies can be met um, and the statute. Um, we do meet with the county to talk about the value of the project so that we can understand what the increments, um, better estimate the increments that can be generated. And all of our tax increment financing um, assistance packages have to be approved by this body, by the HRA board. Um, real quickly, uh, most common types of districts that we do are the redevelopment TIF district, which is um, based on the conditions of the site 
before the development happens, and then a housing TIF district, which is based on the conditions of the site after the project. So there is income restrictions, and it's how the property is used after. Um, TIF limitations, prohibited uses, that's mainly for common areas of, and parks and then government buildings. And then just that a redevelopment TIF district cannot be used to build buildings, um, and that would be a, a affordable housing project is the only thing that you can use redevelopment tax increment to actually construct. Um, and then our policies, city and HRA policies. So we have the limitation that we have about our informal policy for capturing no more than 10% of our tax base in tax increment districts. And that is something that we do evaluate any time our request comes in for um, establishing a new TIF district. Um, and that, so that is 10% um, of the tax base. And that is um, in place because our bond rating agencies kind of look at how robust is our tax base. And so this is something that has allowed the city to continue with its high credit rating by m managing that 10% limit. Um, and then the other policy that we like to adhere to as much as we can is doing pay-as-you-go financing for tax increments. That shifts the risk to the developer that the um, project gets built and generates tax increments and that they're repaid their investment. Um, and then just real quick on our temporary TIF. So this was the allowance to spend unobligated TIF balances that we adopted in June of 22. Um, we did transfer all the um, eligible tax increments to the holding account by the end of last year as required. We did do a supplement to the TIF spending plan in February of this year. And our total uncommitted balance right now is 21149000 We do have a request for Little Africa Plaza that's in the works and will be coming to this body for approval. Um, and this uh, temporary TIF does require all spending to be done by the end of 25. So we're managing this as staff looking for opportunities to make sure that we can uh, meet those statutory deadlines. Um, so now here is uh, a summary of our current Pay 23, we have 57 total TIF districts in the city. 44 of those are HRA administered TIF districts, and 13 of those are administered by the Port Authority. That just is who manages, gets the receipts, and who manages those contracts and obligations within those TIF districts. Um, for Pay 23, these 57 TIF districts capture 7.78% of the city's tax base. Um, so considerably below the 10%, and this table shows a five-year history, and we've been um, managing well below that 10% um, over the last five years, and you can see the total tax base change has been growing every year over those five years as well, and then the TIF captured has been um, growing as mostly, but then it, it declined in, in 22, and that was due to decertifying of TIF districts. Um, Recently established TIF districts, so the HRA has established four TIF districts over the last two years. In 21, we did two new housing TIF districts on the Ford site. Um, those parcels were already in the Ford redevelopment TIF district, and we re removed those parcels to put them in new affordable housing TIF districts. Um, and then the 520 Payne Avenue project, the Hollows, um, that was a new housing TIF district. And then the Fourth one was the Farwell Yards redevelopment, which just occurred um, and had a groundbreaking. Um, and so that is capturing tax increments from an affordable and a market rate project. Um, and the assistance was used to build a new road, um, Bidwell Street, and then to finance the gap in the affordable housing project, 115 um, Plato Boulevard. Um, so here is a list of the TIF districts that are gonna be decertifying. Um, and this is from the period on this slide is 23 through 26. Um, and so this shows the Williams Hill TIF District, which is a Port Authority TIF District. Um, their Port Board just recently um, allowed that to be decertified early. So that is decertifying much earlier than its terms. Um, and then the other one on this slide, Coke Mobile, is a TIF District of the HRAs that we expect to decertify early. Um, and we would expect to decertify that next year in 24 and that will be um, about seven years earlier than anticipated, or than allowed by, um, by terms. The others on this list are, they're, they're expiring by their natural terms of the um, allowed TIF district. Um, this shows TIF districts decertifying in 27 and 28, and again, these are all by their terms. Um, so we have the North Quadrant Housing, which was a specially legislated housing district 
um, and then the Riverfront Renaissance, um, which is a large area, upper landing in U.S. Bank, um, and the Emerald, those are some of the larger ones, but these are all just sort of fine by their terms. Um, and so then what this table shows here is how do we think our captured tax capacity will change um, with the decertifying TIF districts as well as the new TIF districts that I mentioned already that have been approved. Um, so you can see in this table here that um, we do expect to increase to 9.19% in pay 28. Um, and that is largely due to new TIF districts coming online. Um, among those, the Ford site, um, and then also the Minnesota Events TIF district is it been allowed to be extended another 10 years. Um, and so we want to kind of understand what is our capacity then for proposed new TIF districts. Um, we do have the landmark towers, commercial and office space um, conversion into 187 rental units that we've received an application for. So that is expecting to start collections in pay 26 if it's all approved, and that would be capturing 602,000. And then we have um, been uh, solicited with interest to do TIF at the Hillcrest site, at the Heights, to uh, finance affordable housing. Um, and so those are two areas that we just, were just mentioning. They have not been approved. They've not been before this body. Um, and so this slide just means to show what do we think our captured capacity is. Um, and so you can see on the, the fourth bullet, um, we basically have room to capture by pay 28, which I wanted to stress that pay 28 is actually construction in 26 because there's a two-year lag from when you construct it to when it gets assessed to when you get to capture it. Um, so pay 28 would be 180 million of commercial development or 288 million of rental housing is our capacity to stay below the 10%. And then that number will increase um, for rental to 650 million the following year with, again, with TIF districts that are decertifying. Um, that's all I have on my slides and I'm here to answer any questions. Yeah, a couple questions, Commissioner Grenmo. Just, I'm sorry, um, I didn't catch it when you were on the slide, but can you? Oh, sorry. Um, and you don't probably need to pop back to it, but okay. the, um, I think you referred to, I've heard it called unobligated TIF or temporary TIF, but there's 21 million left and you said there's a project coming in for the Little Africa Plaza. Yep. Um, the last line on that slide said that it had to be spent by December 30. Uh, 31 of 25. So does that mean we have to have shipped it out the door yep. or that the project needs to be done spending it? It, it? So the requirement is that it has to commence construction by that date, but we also have that limitation to expend the dollars. So, so if it waited till the very end to start, we would more or less have to send all our money out the door right away. Okay. Yeah. So it has to be out of our hands basically by, yep. the, end of ne by the end of 2025. Correct. Yep. Um, and as long as the project had started. Started, yep. Okay, all right, thank you. Any further questions? Commissioner Prince. Um, I, I didn't hear of a couple of major projects that are, that are online, like the Hams Brewery and Hafner's site, and I'm just wondering, are, are we, have we not gotten to the point of considering TIF for those projects, or, um, are they precluded from TIF under this analysis? Certainly not precluded, and I would say that, that you know, this last slide shows that we do have capacity to do additional TIF district. It's just we don't have a number to kind of um, use, um, so. Just a little okay. further out. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think this is really helpful, and I'm glad uh, we had the update on it. Also, I think it there, there was an article a couple months ago that had a lot of misunderstandings from a professor at the University of Hamlin or Hamlin University, and I think this just shows uh, the actual the actual facts of it rather than yeah. um, assumptions that people put in the paper without doing research. So, thank you very much, Ms. Wolfberry. Always appreciate you. All right, that brings us to the end of this meeting, and uh, we are going to go into recess. Oh, okay. um, because uh, we will be doing the next portion uh, as part of a dance at the city council. So uh, we are in recess.